We've all heard it on the air. Hams bragging about perfect SWR. Way too many hams have made a relentless pursuit of having one-to-one -one SWR no matter what the cost. Let's look at what SWR is and debunk some of the myths and misinformation surrounding it. Welcome back to the DX Engineering Channel. I'm Michael KI8R. I've had the privilege of being in this hobby for over 44 years. In all that time, I've heard way too many hams refer to flat SWR or perfect SWR. But is there even such a thing and how much does it really matter? Now before we dig into this, let me explain that my goal today is to give you an overall view of what SWR is and hopefully a better understanding of how it impacts your antenna system without getting too deep into the math and science that is way beyond the scope of this video. So what is SWR? SWR is probably one of the most widely used numbers in ham radio today. When you key your transmitter, RF voltage travels down the feed line to the antenna. This is called a forward wave. In most cases, part of the voltage is reflected at the antenna and travels back down the feed line to the transmitter. Think of it as an echo. SWR is a measurement of what happens between the forward and reverse voltage waveforms and how they compare in size. SWR or standing wave ratio or VSWR or voltage standing wave ratio are the same thing. The only difference is how they're measured. SWR is the ratio between two different impedances. For example, if the system impedance is 50 ohm and the load impedance is 100 ohms, then the SWR is 100 divided by 50 or 2, and we write this as 2 to 1. If the load impedance is 25 ohms, we swap the two numbers and the SWR is 50 divided by 25 equals 2, or again, 2 to 1. VSWR is the ratio of the maximum to minimum voltage on a transmission line and is more practical to measure as it measures RF by detecting voltage rather than RF current. Most SWR meters measure the voltage rather and then convert it to power. One other way this can be shown is as return loss. Return loss is the difference in dB between the forward and reflected power. In other words, forward minus reflected power equals return loss. Ideally, we want return loss to be a larger value. The larger the return loss, the less reflected power. Return loss will always be a positive number. Along with this, it's important to understand what impedance is. Impedance is composed of a real resistive part and an imaginary reactive part. Impedance is a complex value that consists of resistance, which does not change by frequency, and reactance, which does change by frequency. Reactance can be further broken down into two parts, a capacitive part and an inductive part. Impedance varies by frequency, but how much really depends on the load. For example, a dummy load is a resistive load which covers a wide frequency range, while an antenna typically will have an impedance that changes with frequency. Antennas typically only work under specific frequency ranges. Also, the impedance of an antenna is impacted by its environment. Ground conditions and other things near the antenna will impact its impedance. To understand what SWR is, let's look at this example. A typical ham station has a source or transceiver and a load and an antenna. If we assume that the source and the load are both 50 ohms, then there's maximum power transfer and all of our power is radiated, or in the case of a dummy load, absorbed by the load. That's assuming there's no feed line loss. But what happens if there's a mismatch between the source and the load? In this case, let's say that the load is 75 ohms. Since there's a mismatch, part of the power is reflected back to the source. With some quick math, we can divide 75 ohms by 50 ohms and we'll show that our SWR is now 1.5 to 1. So how much power is actually reflected to the source? If we look at this table, we can see that 4% of our power is reflected. For 100 watts forward power, that's only 4 watts reflected. Not bad. If we increase our impedance of our load to 100 ohms, that will give us an SWR of 100 ohms divided by 50 ohms, or 2 to 1. Looking at our table again, we can see that 11%, or 11 watts, is reflected. Still, not terrible. 
but we all know that coax has a certain amount of loss or attenuation. So let's say our coax has a loss of 3 dB. If we input 100 watts from our source, this means that 50 watts will be radiated by our load, assuming that our load is 50 ohms and 50 watts is lost as heat in the coax. So what happens when our SWR is 2 to 1? Since we all know from our previous example that 11% of our power is reflected by the, to the transceiver and only 50 watts made it to the load, we can calculate that 5.5 watts will be reflected back to the source. But wait, there's still 3 dB of loss in that cable. That means that only 2.75 watts make it back to the source. But the story doesn't stop here with the reflected power making it back to the source. Reflected power is not loss power. Any power reflect, that is reflected to the load, again, will eventually be radiated by the load or is lost as heat due to cable loss. Let's go back to our chart again. If we have an SWR of 3 to 1, 25% of our power is reflected by, to the source. If our SWR is 10 to 1, 67% of our power is reflected. So you can see that as the SWR increases, so does the amount of reflected power. One other factor to keep in mind is, is as SWR increases, so does the transmission line loss. While this additional loss is typically low, a coax cable with 3 dB of loss and an SWR of 3 to 1 can add an additional 1 dB of loss, while an SWR of 10 to 1 can add an additional 4 dB of loss. This additional loss is dielectric loss because of the higher RF voltage at the standing wave maximum points. You can see this on the chart from the ARRL handbook. With this in mind, let's stick with our prior example with the feed line loss of 3 dB and our SWR at the load of 2 to 1. What is the SWR showing at the radio? Remember that our SWR meter at the radio shows the forward power as 100 watts, but we lost half of our power in the feed line just getting to the load. So the reflected power coming back also lost 3 dB. This will give us a reading on our SWR meter of approximately 1.6 to 1, much lower than the actual SWR of 2 to 1. If the feed line loss was higher, then the SWR would appear even lower. Let's look at this a different way. If we have an SWR meter at the radio end of the coax that shows 2 to 1, and a feed line loss at 3 dB, what is the SWR at the antenna? If we look at this chart, you'll see that the actual SWR is 5 to 1, much more than our SWR meter is telling us. If we go back to this chart, you'll see that 5 to 1 shows an additional 1.8 dB of loss, giving you 4.8 dB of total loss. Let's look at this another way. If we take a long piece of RG8X coax, say 100 feet, and terminate it at one end, we would expect that our antenna analyzer would show an infinite SWR, but will it? Let's start at 160 meters and work our way up the bands. On 160, the SWR shows almost infinite, but let's move up a bit. On 40 meters, the SWR is 14 to 1. On 10 meters, the SWR is 6 to 1. On 2 meters, the SWR is 3.2 to 1. Do you see a trend here? The loss in the coax is hiding what the actual SWR is, in this case, infinite. And just for reference, our G8X has approximately 4 dB of loss on 2 meters at 100 feet. Yeah. The long and the short of it is this. If you have a long cable run with a lossy cable, your SWR measurement can be deceiving. But it's not all gloom and doom. A well-designed antenna system with low loss coax can perform very well, even if the SWR approaches 2 to 1. For example, if you build a 40 meter dipole and tune it for resonance at 7150, the SWR will likely be 2 to 1 at the band edges, but this is still acceptable and your radio won't care. Even with the 11% of your power reflected back to the radio at the band edges, and assuming you're using good quality coax like DXC213 or DXC400 Max, most of your power will be radiated by your antenna. So the takeaway here is that to really know what's going on, you need to measure your SWR at the antenna. Here are some things to keep in mind that go along with this subject. 
A resonant dipole is 72 ohms. A resonant vertical is about 36 ohms. A resonant Yagi will be even lower. The point here is that the lowest SWR may not always be one-to-one, -one, but your antenna will still be resonant. Reflected power is not loss power. As we discussed earlier, reflected power is reflected back to your transmitter from the antenna, but it's then reflected back to the antenna again, and most of the power is eventually radiated, assuming that you have good quality low loss coax. Most modern rigs will easily handle an SWR of 2 to 1 without any damage. Remember, reflected power is not absorbed by your transmitter. A low SWR does not mean that your antenna is radiating efficiently. If the SWR stays low over a large frequency range, something is very wrong. Coax is arguably the most important part of any antenna system. If you cut corners here, your antenna system will suffer. There is no magical length of coax that will make your antenna work better, nor is there a multiple half wavelength that will make your antenna system work better. The best length of coax is what it takes to get from the back of your rig to the feed point of your antenna. Buying cheap coax from Amazon, eBay, or a ham fest just to save a dollar is never a good idea. Ask the customer I spoke with recently who just ordered new coax to replace the junk he got from Amazon. Also, coax has a lifespan. This will depend on the quality of the coax you're using. There are also a number of factors that contribute to this, such as UV, water ingress, physical damage from stress, someone stepping on your cable, an animal chewing on it, the list goes on and on. Here's a picture of some coax that I replaced on a friend's tower late last year. This coax is 10 years old. As you can see, it was in really poor condition. So the bottom line here is that it's best to test your coax when it's newly installed and then periodically to see if there are any changes. Keep a log of your readings, and if there's something that changes, such as the SWR is suddenly lower, there is likely an issue. Also, it's a good idea to do a physical inspection of your cables annually to ensure that there isn't any physical damage or degradation of the cable. There's a lot more on this subject that I can cover in just one video. If you'd like to dig into the subject of SWR further, there are a lot of great resources, including the ARRL Handbook, the ARRL Antenna Handbook, as well as a number of good articles that are available online. I'll put links down in the description. Thanks for watching today. I'm Michael, KI8R, and we'll catch you on the next one.